Thank you for joining us for our special Heritage at Home virtual tour of one of the finest neo-Gothic churches in the country, St Mary Magdalene Church in Westbourne. My name is Lorraine and I'm a Heritage Pioneer volunteer based at St Mary Magdalene's. During this virtual tour we'll be exploring the church's rich Victorian heritage, beginning with the great vision of its founders and architects, right through to the role that the church plays in the local community today. St Mary Magdalene's hasn't always looked as remarkable as it does now. From the mid-20th century, the church fell into disrepair and its fabric slowly deteriorated. In July 2017, a significant conservation project began, which saw the church lovingly restored and a beautiful new heritage building added alongside. We'll talk more about this later in the tour. The church was built between 1865 and 1873 by the first vicar, Father Richard Temple West, and his architect, George Edmund Street. They were friends, a street worshipped at the church that West was curate of, All Saints, near Oxford Circus, the pioneering church of Anglo-Catholicism in London. Father West was personally wealthy and very good at raising money, so the church was well built and was completed as Street intended it. This was rare for Victorian churches. It was built by rich men to serve an area that was desperately poor and very overcrowded. A significant feature of the church's design was that there were no pews. This was quite advanced thinking. They wanted the poor to come. Chairs couldn't be rented by the rich, unlike pews. Anglo-Catholic Mass was full of colour, ritual and music, and it focused on the altar, which was believed to communicate the truths of Christianity well to the poor. At this time, the local area looked very different to today. Woodchester Street, which is now Rowington Close, was extremely narrow, and standing here, you could be forgiven for thinking the design of the church was rather plain. The west wall was built right up to the boundary of the neighbouring row of houses, which were later demolished in 1913 to build the primary school, and due to the narrowness of the street, it was impossible to stand back and appreciate the church from any real distance. In contrast, the transept with the tower and the apse at the east end of the church make up the part of the church that was designed to be seen. Five roads converged here. The steeple, standing at 79 metres high, features the structural polychromy style, using the different colours of the elements as decoration. You can probably see why Street's detractors called this the streaky bacon style of architecture. You can see this in medieval buildings in Belgium, for instance, where Street often travelled. Also un-English is the shape of the east end of the church, as English medieval parish churches normally end in a flat wall, not an apse like this, which is more common in France or Belgium. But the shape works brilliantly in this setting, moving the eye around. Let's take a moment to study the sculptures at the east end of the church. Above the ceremonial transept door, we can see Thomas Earp's depiction of Mary Magdalene meeting the risen Jesus on Easter Day. During the recent restoration, these sculptures were carefully repaired as the hands and halos had unfortunately fallen off. Martin Travers War Memorial, designed in 1929, was also restored during the conservation works. The figure of Christ is gilded cast iron. You often see people stopping to pray at the foot of the cross, as you might in Belgium or France, where such wayside calvaries are more common. The Latin words infinitum est have been engraved into the stonework below the figure of Christ. This translates to, it isn't finished. However, it isn't known what this refers to. What's surprising is that there was originally a street of houses which ran between the church and the canal. Clarendon Street was the longest road in London with no side roads coming off it and the houses back directly onto the canal. The north porch on the canal side of the church 
was its main entrance until the street became derelict in the 1950s and the porch was bricked up to stop antisocial activity. This was uncovered again during the conservation project and was considered to be a huge heritage gain. Coming into the church via the north porch, worshippers could pass from darkness into light. Looking down the nave from west to east is the view that street wanted to be seen on entering the church. The magnificent ceiling depicts 72 saints and biblical characters arranged in 12 compartments for the 12 months of the year, with the figures appearing in the month of their feast day. January is the furthest west, for instance, with St Agnes appearing above Eve. The saints on the north side of the ceiling are female and the south side male. In the 1870s, the congregation sat men on the south side and the women on the north side of the nave, so each could look up across the aisle at their fellows in the company of saints. What looks like flames on the ceiling are in fact rays of sun representing divine light. During the conservation works in 2018, 20 conservators worked over six months to clean the ceiling which had become blackened by over a century's worth of pollution and burning of incense. From the west end of the nave it is possible to see that the church is not symmetrical. There is a proper wide south aisle but only a false north aisle a few feet wide. This is because of the constraints of the site but street's cleverness is demonstrated by the way that it still feels harmonious. Street had to build on a steeply sloping site with a drop of six metres from Clarendon Street on the north to Woodchester Street on the south. And so the church's undercroft was his level platform on which to build the nave. This space is exactly the same size as the nave and was meant to provide space for parish activities. The vaulted ceiling is made of poured concrete, which was a very new material in 1865. The north wall has arches to disperse the physical forces involved in retaining 10 metres or so of earth. Tucked away in the south aisle of the undercroft is the magnificent Chapel of St Sepulchre, currently closed awaiting restoration. This heritage gem was created in 1894 to 1895 by Ninian Compa as a memorial to Father West. In effect, it is a Chantry Chapel where Mass could be said for the repose of his soul. Currently, the chapel is screened off from the undercroft to prevent damp from spreading. However, the conditions have now been stabilised through improved drainage and fundraising can begin to save this nationally important heritage masterpiece. The vision is that, once complete, the screens will be replaced with glass panels opening up a magical contained space for regular worship and art performances. The chancel is the holiest place in the church and so is the most decorated. The ceiling, painted by Daniel Bell, shows Christ in majesty surrounded by saints and angels appear over the sanctuary and choir. The glass in the chancel, designed by Henry Holiday, is very fine with scenes of St Mary Magdalene, the Blessed Virgin, and the Passion and Resurrection of Christ. Street's architectural drawing of the Reardus shows how closely his design was executed by Thomas Earp. Looking down the church to the west, you get a real sense of the majesty of the space. The triple arch is very similar to George Edmund Street's Great Hall at the Royal Courts of Justice, arguably his most famous project. However, this remained unfinished at the time of his death in 1881. Above the arches, the stained glass window illustrates a song of praise to God. Today, in partnership with the church, Paddington Development Trust delivers a lively community and arts programme for young people, families and adults 
and a rapidly growing calendar of cultural events. Using the extraordinary spaces within the church and new building, Grand Junction at St Mary Magdalene's sits at the centre of the community, bringing together people of all faiths and none, bridging some of the parallel worlds of 21st century London. This brings us to the end of our virtual tour. If you've enjoyed learning about the fascinating heritage of St Mary Magdalene's and would like to support our work, please visit our website www.grandjunction.org.uk and sign up to our mailing list or make a donation.